Deputy Politan, thank you for joining us on Closing Arguments. Get ready, Monday it begins. The trial of the second half of the doomsday couple. But let's take a moment before we get to him and her and remember what this case is really about. Three people who should be here today. Little JJ who went missing. Grandpa was concerned, grandma was concerned and it started the whole search. Tylee who lost her life, who was murdered. Her mother's already been held responsible. And Tammy, the devoted, faithful wife of Chad Daybell for all those years, raising all those children, doing everything right. She's gone too. Now, so who's left? Well, the doomsday couple. But they're, they're kind of... They're kind of jammed up right now. Lori's been convicted of the murder. She's serving life in prison. She has a second trial that's getting ready to take place in Arizona involving the murder of her prior husband, Charles. And there's Chad. He's getting ready. Monday, it all begins for him. And he's been implicated in the murder of Lori's two children, plus the murder of his faithful and loving wife, Tammy. Now, this was a steamy, hot love affair. Soon after Tammy was dead, they were together, running down to Hawaii, getting married, and spending that bag of money from the insurance, which was collected very quickly, by the way. Um, I want you to take a listen to some folks who were kind of in the circle of Chad and Lori as they describe what this relationship was like. Did Lori ever indicate to you whether or not she and Chad were engaged in an affair? She would just share that they were intimate. Was this while Charles was still alive? Yes. Was this while Tammy was still alive? Yes. Did Lori indicate whether or not she thought it was okay that they were engaging in intimate relations? She did. She, she felt it was, it was um, according to God's will. And did she tell you, ever expand on why she believed it was according to God's will? Yes, she explained that because they had been married in multiple lives and they had a mission together that it was okay. To me, it seemed like they were acting like a couple of teenagers that were first in love and they were holding hands and sitting real close to each other and <clears throat> Chad was rubbing her leg and I just thought that was odd for your spouse just passed within week and a half. They were uh, really loving with one another and, and affectionate. Now at this time were you aware that he was still married to Tammy Daybell? Yes. Okay. Did that, the fact that he was married come up at all? Yes. All right. How did that happen? Uh, I, I asked him about the I just asked him how his marriage was with the Tammy and if she was a good wife. And he said he had no complaints that she was a good wife, but he said her time was uh, her time was coming up, and that her her and uh, him and Lori were gonna you know go do the things that they had committed to do for God. It was my understanding that her belief system had changed because of this group that she had recently become a part of. He was trying to teach me about some of their beliefs. Um, uh, about the, the gathering of the 144,000 and uh, and then Satan having powers to push people out of their bodies and, and then the spirits being stuck. Lori and Chad um, were teaching that if you had been exalted in another um, world, another probation, then this uh, time that you came to the earth, um, it didn't count for you because you had already proven yourself another probation. And she would often say, it doesn't count for me. Do you recall who else you were told was dark? So it was Charles, it was Brandon, her brother, not Alex, but another brother of hers, eventually her dad, and then Tylee, then Kay, then at the very end, JJ. And during her trial, 
Lori Daybell, I mean, she really didn't fight the charges. I mean, she was almost happy to be there, it, it seemed. It was really strange, bizarre behavior by someone facing the rest of her life in prison, accused of murdering her children. But she didn't really put up a fight. And something else, she never turned on Chad. Never. In fact, she got a little upset when her own attorney um, criticized Chad's books, his, his writings. I mean, she is still, like, in love with this guy, infatuated with this guy, and would never turn on him. She did speak, though, at the end of the case, at her sentencing, and no one will ever forget this statement. I was told by Jesus that I needed to go back and complete things that I had covenanted or promised to do before I was born. This caused me a lot of distress because I knew heaven was my real home and I only wanted to be there. I was free from pain, emotional and physical. But then I was shown how I would help my children and others in the future. So ultimately I did agree to go back to my body. Jesus knows me and Jesus understands me. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and Tammy. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. Bizarre. Let's bring in our special guest. Joining us in San Antonio, Texas, Lori Vallow's cousin and author of the book, I Walked Through the Fire to Get Here, Megan Connor joining us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Megan, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Let's start with the statement that we just heard from that moment in court because she sort of sat throughout this trial, was not, not allowing her lawyers to fight this case. Um, what did you hear in that statement, and, and what did you see when you saw Lori making that statement? It just confirmed for me uh, that she was still deluded into thinking that um, she hadn't done anything wrong. And I was, I was infuriated with how disrespectful that statement was to her victims, and it was just very difficult to listen to. It was... Um, it was really just mind blowing. I, I had so many emotions come up listening to that statement and I still do even now so long afterwards, um, just realizing that she really is not herself. Well, when, when you say she's not herself, you knew her before the rest of us knew her. Um, take us back to that time and then compare and, and explain to us when these changes happened and when you noticed these changes happening? Well, when we were kids, she was a bright, bubbly, smart, funny, um, you know, kid and teenager. She was the cheerleader. She was, um, she would always command a room. She loved to sing. She loved to dance. And I think, you know, those personality traits, some of them continued. But when we were young adults, I started to notice her sort of manipulative behavior behaviors. I started to notice that she was more interested in getting what she wanted than she was in maintaining relationships with people. And it was difficult to watch those personality traits come out. Um, when she decided to divorce Joe Ryan and she started making accusations against him, I didn't really know what to think of all of that. I was going through some difficult things myself. And that's really the last time that we were in close contact. I only saw her occasionally at family events after that. So, um, I know that she was already down this kind of, as Judge Boyce said, religious rabbit hole when I heard that she was attending the temple every day. I knew that she was enjoying Visions of Glory and other near-death experience books. So I knew that she was kind of going off in a direction that wasn't traditional for our faith. And um, I didn't really know Chad Daybell, never met him, but Lori was definitely already in a place at that point where she was 
manipulating people. She was, um, she kind of had her little group of followers that she controlled and told what to do. So that part of it was not new um, when she met Chad. So, you know, one way that she was portrayed, and I'm trying to understand this, the, the dynamics and the relationship, um, it, prosecutors seem to argue that Lori was the one sort of in charge of this couple. And what you're describing to me, someone who's able to manipulate people and get them to do what she wants, um, do you see, would you see that as consistent, that she could be in a relationship with a man and she's sort of in charge of that relationship? Yeah, it's such an interesting dynamic because I definitely saw, you know, in, since reading all the FOIA documents and every interview and every video and sort of looking at listening to the, the podcast that she was involved in, it's really interesting to see this dynamic where she was sort of covertly manipulating what she wanted, but at the same time using Chad's um, beliefs and his whole structure of theology as a justification for her kind of getting what she wanted, being in a position of power where she could tell other people what to do and she could sort of play out her own narrative of how she wanted to, you know, get out of Charles's life and be free of the children. It was just really scary to watch those two dynamics come together and play together to, to end in tragedy. Now, I think another relationship that will be front and center in, in the upcoming trial of Chad Daybell will be the relationship of Lori and her brother, Alex. How well did you know Alex and what were your thoughts of this brother-sister relationship of your cousins? I knew Alex very well. Um, we spent a lot of time together as young adults, when, and especially when he lived in San Antonio with his parents here in town. He spent some time living at my parents' house, and we, we did spend a lot of time together, so I felt like I knew him pretty well. Um, I, I always knew him to be somebody who was sort of detached emotionally, wasn't really capable of forming um, emotional connections with people. Um, he sort of played off everything serious as a joke, and so he didn't really face up to serious conversations. He never wanted to have confrontations. Um, he would make jokes about those things. But as soon as I understood what had happened with him assaulting Joe Ryan and him going to prison for that assault, that sort of turned a corner in my mind about what kind of a person he was and what he was capable of. Let's talk about that manipulation again by Lori in the dynamic between Alex and Lori trying to figure out again who's calling the shots because this all resulted in murders. I mean, horrific murders. Mm -hmm. Could you see a scenario where Lori is manipulating Alex? Are they playing off each other? Is he doing things perhaps to try to please her? How do you see that dynamic? It seemed to me that Alex really wanted to be a protector of Lori. And I think he did definitely see himself that way. And talking with him a little bit after, you know, years after um, the assault on Joe Ryan, I think he really did believe that he was protecting Lori from somebody dangerous and protecting the children from somebody dangerous. And so I think he did view that as his role as, as her older brother, but also when Lori wanted something to get done, it got done. She, she's always been kind of the person in the family who could dictate something and people would go along with it um, because it was good to have her approval. She was, you know, um, a person that was bright and funny and, and all those things. But if you did something she didn't like, she could be really vicious and unkind. And I think people in the family not wanting to see that side of her were a lot more willing to go along with whatever it was that she wanted to get done. And how has the rest of her immediate family reacted to all of this? I mean, this is a huge case. Now it's a second trial. Um, the names, the faces, the images, the stories are out there. Um, how are they living the rest of their lives? I think it's been devastating for everyone. Um, somebody who interviewed me at one point commented that um, that murderers kill their families too. And I think that's absolutely true. Our family will never be the same after this. I know everybody's kind of handling it in their own way. I think some healthier than others. 
I just think it's it's a tragedy that everybody who knew Lori and loved Lori, knew the kids and loved the kids are just ripped apart by this. And it's not something any of us will ever truly recover from. None of us will ever be the same after this. Megan Connor, appreciate uh, your time tonight. Um, again, the book, I Walked Through the Fire to Get Here. Um, we appreciate your insight. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. When we come back, they are live in studio. The question for Josh and Molly and Daryl, will Chad turn on Lori? The answer when we return. Ion kicks off the National Women's Soccer League, airing all season long. She scores! She's on See the full schedule and find where to watch at IonNWSL.com. We are moving closer to trial in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. What did you find when you looked at his search history? Uh, one thing that I found was um, that on the 8th, in the afternoon hours, um, the user of this account, um, the owner of the account was Chad Daybell. The user of this account um, looked up um, what the wind direction was going to be for the next day. Well, and the next day would be September 9th of 2019? That's correct. Okay. Um, did that have any significance to you as an investigator? It did because of uh, other things that I had learned um, and that uh, that is the day that uh, Chad Daybell had said he was going to uh, burn limbs and kill a raccoon okay. in his yard. Did you follow that? Chad Daybell's looking up which way is the wind going to be blowing tomorrow. As a prophet, maybe he should know. Um, but anyway, which way is the wind going to be blowing? And then the next day, he was burning limbs. And it all is connected to this text message that he sent to his wife, Tammy. And of course, we're talking about right around the time um, that these children go missing, J.J. and Tyler. Take, take a listen uh, to the detective here now talking about these text messages, these really weird text messages that Chad is sending to Tammy. 9-9-2019, 9, 11-53-27 a.m. from Chad. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery. Fun times. Gonna shower now and then go right for a while at BYU. Love you. Good for you. I'm back home now. After reviewing hundreds of tips containing information, photographs, video footage taken from across Yellowstone National Park on or around that date, 8th, the 8th of September, 2019. I was well aware that that was the last day that Tylee Ryan was seen alive. And so upon reading this text message, uh, wherein sent from Chad, wherein he claims to have built a fire, shot and killed a large animal and buried it on his property, I became concerned because I recognized that it was sent the day after Ty Ryan was last seen alive. And this is the backyard, and this is where the remains of Tylee were found. She was found uh, partially, or burnt remains in a, in a pet cemetery. Uh, JJ had more of a burial in, in a separate part of the yard, but the remains of both children were found in the backyard. Um, so those are two of the murders that Chad Daybell will be facing implicated in those two murders. And the third is his wife, Tammy Daybell. I want you to take a listen, uh, and there you see the two of them together. I mean, all she did was love him, 
help raise his children, be faithful. That's all she did. And here's Dr. Eric Christensen, who talked about what um, was found in the autopsy after her body was exhumed, when everything else came to light that, no, uh, we got to take a second look at what happened to Tammy. In addition to having you know, no anatomical uh, abnormalities, no organ pathology uh, per se, no pneumonia, no other pathologic process that would explain her death, she did also have some injuries uh, on her arms, very nonspecific blunt injuries, uh, bruises uh, on her right arm, left arm, and on her left chest, uh, which were determined to be uh, relatively acute injuries, had happened you know, within the hours uh, around the time of her death. Um, it would be, by their nature, blunt, those types of blunt injuries are not specific, uh, but they are certainly consistent with uh, someone being restrained um, and uh, would be, uh, you know, consistent with asphyxia as a cause of death as well. You did a lot of testing for poisons, right? Yes. And that's basically because... She had such a, I don't want to say normal, but normal um, autopsy. I mean, it, 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 was, it was hard to, to find a cause of death, right? That's why you kind of lean towards poisoning. Is that right? Uh, that's certainly part of the reason, yes. So can they tie Chad Daybell to all three deaths in this case? And if so, does he turn around and point the finger at Lori? And how would that play out? Let's bring our think tank. Joining us live in studio tonight, criminal defense attorney, entertainment attorney, former assistant DA in Atlanta, Daryl Cohen. Also with us, criminal defense attorney and Emory University law professor, Molly Palmer. And finally, the man behind the glasses, criminal defense attorney, Josh Schiffer. Raccoon expert as well. Okay, <laughs> okay. So can they tie him to all three here? Does it matter? As long as they tie him to one or two, he is going to be convicted, likely getting the death penalty, and bye-bye Chad. Oh, you think the death penalty as oh, well? Oh, absolutely. Okay. He deserves worse than that. He deserves life in prison in a place where they don't like people who harm or murder kids. Yeah, I think in general, when you have a jury deciding multiple murders, if you can get them to agree on maybe one, when they go back and deliberate, sometimes it's easier for them to say, look, if you killed one person, you might have had the capacity to kill others. So. And, and that's exactly why the state doesn't want right. to have a giant case. They want to make this as small as possible. And I encourage prosecutors when they're facing a really big set of potential things to talk about, don't. You don't need 50 charges. You need a couple. You need a handful. And what that testimony we just watched said was, Chad Daybell's a liar. We all know he's a liar. No, raccoons do not walk around. If you've ever hunted raccoons, they aren't out during the day. The, 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 even the, with the mask? Even with the mask. The lies? Badito raccoon. We have lots of lies. Or let me ask you this now. Lori, faithful. She'll be faithful till, mm -hmm. till, till doomsday. Will Chad be faithful to Lori in that he won't implicate her? He will stand by her side? not say that she's the one responsible for what happened here? I think he's going to implicate her. I think, well, I mean, we, we've heard from his adult children, Emma Daybell, now Emma Murray. She said in the past that she thinks this whole thing was Lori and Alex Cox. And I think, you know, Chad seems to be somewhat less devoted. He's always seemed to be somewhat less devoted. And if you have his family talking to him and his lawyers talking to him, and this is really probably the best defense strategy... Why not? See, I don't think it matters what the strategy is. I think he's going to go down whether he decides. Well, there's going to be a strategy, though, right? But it doesn't matter. Sometimes things matter. Words matter. In this case, strategy, in my view, doesn't matter because there's too much evidence, and it's horrendous what he did or what he's charged with doing, and in my view, will be convicted of doing. And, so strategy doesn't matter. And really, it depends on what the goal of the defense is. One goal is, yeah, I want to get Chad Daybell acquitted. I, I don't really think that's very likely. More likely, the goal is keep the needle out of his arm. And that's a very different process than I didn't do it. It's much more, you guys can convict me of this, but it's not bad well, enough to I think the, the biggest problem he has along those lines, number one, burning children and burning them in your backyard, not a good look. But now, like, Tammy Daybell, like, he's in 
in their own home. But but what does he get if he implicates her and passes the blame? Is that a request to acquit him and absolve him of guilt? Does that move the needle with the death penalty portion of this? Because remember, after this trial, there will be appeals and appeals and appeals. The game changes for the defense from here's a good defense to here's a defense that will keep the needle out of his arm, which can include messy how. How do you get um, in front of this jury, like the fact that Lori is, as we learned in the prior segment from her cousin, very manipulative and can make men do things like her own brother, like her own brother will do whatever, shoot my husband, he shot her husband. It has to be done with cross-examination of the state's witnesses, even if the state's witness has no clue what, why they're being asked such a question, the questions themselves can lead to a story that can plant in the jurors' minds why he did what he did. Don't yeah. say it will, but can't. And you know, we see this footage of Lori. We, we, you know, you, you, we, we have to wonder what's gonna actually come in, but I think if Lori comes in in any capacity, whether she's a witness, I mean, is she gonna be a witness? Whether we see any footage of her being arrested, there's something about her. I think all of us, when we see her, we've, we've seen that, she's, right? She's the ingenue in this case. She's, she's the vixen, she's the most. Do you think she's, is she the leader here? Is no, she, she's think, not. Because that's what prosecutors argued I, in the last trial. Absolutely. Yeah, but this is a different trial. And I the think prosecutors can they're, they're argue something different? Different prosecutors, different thoughts. All of us can look at the same picture from the same angle, describe it differently. So I prosecuted the last trial, I thought this. Now I'm prosecuting this trial, and I'm thinking this. It's all theory. I thought it was supposed to be getting to the truth. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's what the verdict is supposed to be. And one side does the other, one okay, side does this. One word answer. Get to the truth. Will Chad testify, yes or no? Yo. No. <laughs> no. I, yeah, I think he Yes, no, I, he and, and, and you're on the fence. He blows the fence. up the trial. He's yeah. blowing They're up the trial. They're with us the, rest of the, uh, rest, of the rest of the hour. Up next. <laughs> We're heading back to the low country. Where is the money? That's the question after Alec Murdoch fails a polygraph and we investigate tonight. There were plenty of conversations where I looked people in the eye and I lied to them. There were plenty of times where I took money that I shouldn't have taken. There were plenty of times where I stole money. I can remember a lot of times where I lied to my clients, I misled my clients, and I stole money from my clients in conversations. Seems just like yesterday. Uh, but we've got more, more news regarding Alec Murdoch. Uh, you know, he had, he had a rough go in the murder trial. Very emotional uh, for Murdoch. Uh, it was a tough time. Didn't do that well on the witness stand. Jury obviously did not believe him. Um, but he also had federal uh, charges in, involving all of this fraud. 22 charges of wire fraud, bank fraud, conspiracy to commit wire and bank fraud. <clears throat> Excuse me. Money laundering. I'm getting choked up when I'm talking about Alec Murdoch. Um, <clears throat> originally, he was 155 years in prison, but he got a deal. 27 years to run concurrently with his state sentence. Part of the plea agreement, the defendant agrees to be fully truthful and forthright with the federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies by providing full, complete, and truthful information about all criminal activities about which he or she has knowledge. Well, apparently, he has breached that agreement, according to the feds. Murdoch has failed to cooperate as required under the plea agreement and has failed to polygraph examination administered at the government's request. And with more than $6 million in proceeds remaining unaccounted for, the government is compelled to make every effort to identify the location of any ill-gotten gains to make Murdoch's victims whole. The government therefore requests that the court hold Murdoch in breach of the agreement and find the government's obligations null and void, relieving the government of its obligation to recommend a concurrent sentence. So he is being sentenced on Monday in federal court, or is he the U.S. versus Murdoch? 
Let's bring back in the think tank, Daryl Cohen, Molly Palmer, Josh Schiffer. Where's the money? <laughs> insurance. All this federal case is, is insurance. Just in case, in the unlikely event Where's that he is acquitted. Where's the six million? Who cares? It's gone. It's going to be here. It's going to be there. They're not going to find it. They may find pieces of the six million. But the real thing is, does it matter if he gets 27 years concurrent, consecutive? If his state sentence is upheld... He's still he's holding out for his, his appeal and have some oh, chance yeah. to get he he believes he he's just gonna hold but this would be a problem. Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's a problem. major problem. Yeah. I mean the feds don't play with this. When you <laughs> enter into an agreement with the feds in this type of crime, first you have your plea hearing. The plea is done, and you enter into a contract that's like 35 pages long and includes all these provisions. And now this sentencing, I don't think it's gonna be a sentencing. I think it's gonna be a hearing on breach of contract. And what's ultimately going to happen is the government isn't tethered to their obligation whatsoever because he hasn't performed his end of the bargain. And Alleg now Allegedly. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? You don't trust the polygraph? No, no we don't trust the polygraph. We They're don't trust that. But the wait, problem is which the Which do you trust money. less, the polygraph or Alec Murdoch? The answer is yes. I don't yes. have to trust either, you know? Yes. Well, you <laughs> forgot the third neither. option, the U.S. Uh, Attorney's Office. You trust them? I don't trust. The, I don't necessarily <laughs> trust them either. But, I mean, they definitely do not have to hold so up their end the of the money? deal. Where's is, the is there six million? Is there someone with a bag of money? Is it buried yes, somewhere? Yes, there absolutely is. The Spears. drug dealer, remember, it was like $50,000 a week in pills. It was some outrageous amount because he had a really bad drug habit where yeah. his bad habit was paying way too much for his drugs. And that really does happen. A lot of that $6 million disappeared into the wind because you just watched Alec Murdoch. But the, Why couldn't I he be truthful? For... Why couldn't he be truthful Why about would he be it? truthful? Does it matter? Yes, it's part of his knows. deal. It's and the maybe... only chance he has to maybe, if he wins an appeal, to get a breath of fresh air down in the low country. Right, so 27 year, 27 year sentence if they go back to what they said. And in the federal system, you serve a third, nah, half, nah, two thirds, nah, 85%, yeah. Okay. So he's gonna be, if he's out at all, he'll be walking like this and thinking like, I need to lie again and get myself younger. Now, you definitely want to tell the truth with the feds, and the only reason he's not is that there is something else going on. There's it could be drugs. It could be some other shady, low-country lawyer. It could be some accomplice. Could two other dudes that got that, convicted, remember, and that could impact them. For is sure. Maybe there's some covering going on. In general, you want to tell the truth with the feds, and if you're not, it's because something else matters more to you than getting that 27-year sentence. But remember, we watched him try to admit guilt for every crime that could be. <laughs> yeah, come on, we just showed it. That guy was admitting everything as much as he probably remembers. Because if he really was doing that much dope, he doesn't have a memory where that money went. All right, so let's, let's get to, to, so at the hearing, this is going to be chaos. I think so. I mean, you start off addressing breach because what the judge usually does is go to the terms of the plea agreement, calculate the sentencing guidelines, take up any objections, and then go to argument. But breach, that's a huge, uh, that's going to take so hours. So could, could, could they just throw the whole thing out and yep. have a trial? No, no. You, no. The he already done. pled. He, he already he's pled. He's gone. It's a question of how long he's gone if his sentence in the state is not upheld. Yeah, think about it like this. You agree to plead guilty. And how you get sentenced and how the federal government's going to talk to the judge about your sentence totally depends on what you do after you plead guilty. Mm -hmm. If you give them everything they want, they're going to say your cooperation level was high or adequate they or substandard. Will the results of the polygraph? Is that, the a, is that a thing? the defense should. The defense oh, should. Totally. But that's not the only issue. Totally. So the folks issue at home right now are saying... Wait, polygraphs? I thought they weren't admissible. They are. Why we use, they are sometimes admissible. For instance, in Georgia, if both sides agree, they're admissible. Used to be not admissible. So how did you get it in? You had your client take a polygraph, and when somebody was on cross-examination, you would say, "Is it true that he's took it past a polygraph?" As the DA's office objects, and you say, "Your Honor, I was wrong, but the jury has heard it." No, so I mean you sneak it in the back door. But here again, it seems like everyone is is on board with this polygraph, or no? I mean, I think that obviously his lawyers had to allow him to sit for it. But, I mean, to bring it in, I think that that's less of an issue before the court, as is the fact that they believe there is $6 million that remains unaccounted uh, for. Admissibility of the polygraph is a foregone conclusion. It's coming in because they did it in conjunction with the state. The weight of those results, 
That's something the defense can actually make hay out of because, and you've worked with polygraphs before, they're not infallible and there are really good arguments. But Molly's right. But he's right. not a good liar. No, but, but he's terrible. a liar. But this six doesn't million matter. Dollars. He's We're not find trying more. to convince anybody. <laughs> the judge is going to do what the judge is going to do. And if the judge doesn't like Alec Murdoch and how could he, he's going to go to the upper part of the guidelines. All right. Period. We shall see. It's all happening on Monday. Up next. In tonight's Tank Takes, a suspect in Georgia takes off in a front loader and is chased by another front loader, causing quite a scene in the streets. And tonight we're wondering, is this just another day in Atlanta traffic? A Michigan mother accused of killing her husband and then fleeing the country. The defendant was extradited from Italy. His charred remains found in a box in a blueberry patch. The defendant could be punished with life without parole. Two people have been convicted in this case. Was Beverly McCallum running away from a criminal past? Now it's up to a jury to decide. The Fugitive Wife Murder Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, 8, 7 central on Court TV. Welcome back. Time for tonight's Tank Takes, where we take a look at the world of crime and justice and those stories that we save for the end. And our first story tonight is Sex Toy Story. Uh, this one comes to us out of uh, New York, a manufacturer of these fantasy-themed sex toys has accused an upstart Brooklyn, New York firm of knocking off its distinctive designs that it has for its sex toys. And the federal lawsuit alleges the defendant has infringed on the copyrights for these sex toys. So my question is for our think tank tonight, which of these toys has the best name? And I've got a few of them for you. There's Spritz the Sea Dragon, Stan the T-Rex, Kelvin the Ice Dragon, Tyson the Water Buffalo, Jason the Demogorgon, and Cuttlefish. C C cuttlefish, so you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't finish the full Cuttlefish one there. We Mr. did look them all Mr. up. <clears throat> Love is like candy on a shelf, is what Tom Jones said. You want to see some and help yourself. Oh my gosh. Sex bomb, sex. Oh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> Are these sex toys confusingly similar, which I believe is the legal standard for infringement? I, I would need to inspect. <laughs> You're more. expecting them delivered on a silver platter to all of these sex toys. That would be There's not just those. There's a foot. There's a paw. There, there are some things on that. So I, I'm an experienced middle aged man. The Do they dragons. have a case? Well, <laughs> um, I don't know if they carry the case or not. They probably I just, plain wrap paper. I hope they likely. find vindication and the business can continue to thrive. And I we'll just want to be <laughs> that patent attorney or that AIP attorney second grade teacher because that's 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 eating a lot of crow right there. Never going to be What kind something. of juror would you be looking for, Molly? Oh, I know exactly. Oh. What. I would be looking for like a Dungeons and Dragons yeah. juror, you know? I'd be looking for like... That people who are into that kind of anime. This is nerd flag <laughs> flying of the highest level. Some of the name, Drippy Daryl. That was just absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> okay. Daryl, you want the final word on this or do you want to move on to the next story? First and last. I think I need to KYD BMS. Keep my big mouth shut. Okay. Did that start Excellent. with KY? <laughs> jelly. Not jelly. <laughs> Off the rails. <laughs> Second story, I'm calling this one Hot Pants. Uh, we go to um, uh, Northern California. Thieves in Napa Valley stole around $25,000 worth of Lululemon clothes. That's probably about six or seven <laughs> pairs. Um, and then they went into a wild chase and they crashed in a playground in Oakland. The thieves stole more than 200 pairs of these leggings. And Molly, I was wondering, um, who, oh. who wore it better? Who wore it better? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that Josh is wearing it better. Thank I like you. the the, the pink, you know, like your tie. I think the pink is pretty flattering on both of you. No, I mean, I don't mean to be offensive to Daryl, but there was something that felt a little off. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, let me tell you, my daughter Caroline, who's been on the set here, would be chasing those people because all she does is keep Lululemon in business. <laughs> 
Uh, I just think Daryl's abs are fantastic in that picture. Fantastic. Let's get to our final story tonight. Uh, I called this one, Welcome to Georgia. Um, a disgruntled former employee accused of stealing a 75,000 pound tractor leading to a chase. Let's watch. Stop. 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 Hey, stop. This is the radio. An uh, individual who's driving a four-wheeler tractor is not stopping for me. I have no way of stopping this vehicle. He's going to go out on the main road. Dick, watch your dick, you I can control him. Grab your machine. What is it? One of those things? How Yo, fast is it? They can get they can get up probably about 30. Uh, okay, grab that. Quick, quick, quick. All right, it looks like there's only one way to stop a front loader, and you're gonna need another front loader to do it. Um is is this something we'd only see in Georgia? No, they remember this from uh, Mr. OJ's Bronco it's parade, aka Chase. Front loader v front loader, Josh. I, I, I know that, that Bo and Luke are just waiting <laughs> to get into that set. There we go. Heroes to the rescue. <laughs> I want to see a pit maneuver. That's what I really want. This is this is unbelievable. And by the way, he's no longer a suspect. He's a defendant. I love the fact that the officer gave him a verbal warning to stop in order to trigger the obstruction charge. That's Yeah, that was my favorite part, too. Stop, stop. Stop. Unbelievable. <laughs> that only happens in Georgia. And something else only happens in Georgia. It's a birthday today. Oh! oh. Molly Palmer, come on, bring that cake. Producer Josh, please deliver really? it onto the table. Absolutely. There we go. There you are. Aw, thank you. You can thank Mr. Dell for that. It's, it's technically you, next week, but thank well, you. Well, I know. You can thank Miss Holly. I gave you a hint earlier. He uh, was trying to drop it on you all afternoon. <laughs> that is so happy, sweet. Happy birthday. Thank you. Josh Schiffer. Molly Palmer, Daryl Cohen. Before we go today, folks, please take a look at your screens. We have a missing child. This is Mariah Fobbs. Mariah is missing out of Houston, Texas, 17 years old. If you see Mariah, pick up the phone, make the call, 911-1800 The Lost, or you can call the Houston Police Department in Texas. That phone number is on your screen. Let's see if we can get Mariah to a safe place tonight. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you for watching. Have a great night, and as always, please don't forget to hug the kids.